Okay. Um, here we are again. Uh, sorry, we were having some uh, technical issues with our uh, voice. Um, let me know if uh, you can hear us uh, via the uh, chat box or the question box. Okay, Eileen is saying that we can, you can now hear us. Okay, great. Awesome. So I will redo the introduction. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Ankita Patel. I am the Immigrant Justice Program Coordinator at the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, and we uh, have with us Inoka Herrett from the ACLU of Washington, and she will be presenting on History and the Law, How Racism Impacts Immigration Laws Today. Just a couple of logistical announcements before we get started. Um, this is a listen-only webinar, so the best way for you to interact with us is exactly what you were doing, which is uh, typing your um, question for your comments uh, through the question box or the chat box. And I will be uh, paying attention to what you're saying uh, via those and then uh, make sure that Inoka stops and um, answers or comments on some of the things that you're talking about. Also, um, the best way for you to listen is through your computer speakers. If you don't have computer speakers, then make sure you're listening in via phone and uh, select the uh, phone option on your control panel and it should give you a number for you to call in. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Inoka to do a uh, introduction and her own introduction and then we will continue from there. Great, well thank you so much Ankita and thank you everyone for um, being here on Monday morning with me to talk about these issues. Um, the ACLU of Washington works on immigration because we know that when the government has the power to deny legal rights and due process to one vulnerable group, that everyone's rights are at risk. And of course, immigration is a top priority of the Trump administration, and it touches on the fundamental question of what it means to be American and to live here in the US. And while immigration is federal, it's federal law, there's much that we can do locally to protect and expand the rights of non-citizens living in Washington. So today, I'm gonna give you some background on immigration, and I'll go over the racial history of immigration law, and then I'll bring it back to what we're seeing today and Trump's immigration agenda. And then I'll talk about what the ACLU of Washington is doing and what you can do. And I'll try to leave room for questions. But as Ankita said, if you have questions, you know, type them in at any time and I'll be sure to stop and address them. Thanks. Uh, but to start us off, I'd love to hear a little about your immigration, your migration stories. I'm, um, immigration is personal to me. I'm the child of Sri Lankan immigrants. And when I approach these issues, I approach them with that perspective. I believe that my liberation is intrinsically tied to the fight for immigrant rights. And I believe that all of ours is. And when we speak about race or immigration, for me, especially as a lawyer, it's easy to intellectualize the problems, but I think it's actually much more powerful to lead from our own stories. And we all have a migration story of how we or our people got here, you know, to Seattle or to the US. And we're not actually all immigrants. Some of us are or have native or indigenous ancestry. And some of our ancestors were brought to the US against their will as slaves. But migration is an inherently is inherently part of our shared humanity. And because of the forces of assimilation in this country, um, which have existed for generations, um, all of our people's stories have in some way or other gotten silenced. And so I'd like to take um, a second now, I'd like to take a second now and ask you all two questions. If you can respond in the chat box, I'd love to um, see. Where did you or your ancestors and relatives migrate from and when did they come to the US, like in the general like decade? So for example, my, um, my parents came to the U.S. from Sri Lanka in the 1970s. What about other folks? 
Um, Inoka, uh, while we give people a chance to um, answer that question, I'll go ahead and also share a little bit about uh, my migration story. So um, as you and I were talking about the other day, my family moved from India to um, Africa in, in the early 70s, and uh, specifically uh, they moved to Zambia. And it was a really interesting time for us in the sense that um, Zambia gained in independence in 1963. And so uh, my parents moved to quite a young economy and it, everything was new and politically, it was just a very interesting time in the sense that uh, democracy, uh, the democratic process was still being established. So I uh, grew up in that context and uh, I moved here to the US um, in 2000. And so, and uh, I think Clinton was still in office at that time. And so, you know, like I got to experience as a teenager, you know, what 9-11 uh, meant for the U.S., what it meant for immigrate, immigrants and it, what it meant for the world, really, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've been here through all of that and, you know, have been working here and I've been at Wiskede for 10 years. I was just <laughs> telling you that. So that's my migration story in a nutshell. But uh, just to uh, recap what people are saying, you know, people are, they moved uh, here from Mexico City 27 years ago, uh, Honduras in the late 90s, Western Europe 1800s, uh, from Germany, post post -war post -war War right, uh, some people's um, mom is from Brazil, dad is from Israel, uh, they came in the 80s, 60s respectively. Uh, one person said 80s Mexico, uh, mom's grandparents immigrated here from Sweden in the 40s. So there's def everybody definitely has a migration story. Yeah, yeah this, my uh, mom's grandparents immigrated here from Sweden in the 40s and my dad's family immigrated here from Ireland, but don't know when. Um, family members immigrated from Western Europe in the late 1800s. Another one uh, from Germany in the 1700s, from Bohemia in the 1800s. These are great. You know, I, I, I love hearing these stories because I feel like they're such a core part of who we are and they're stories that we don't really get to share. And so um, um, I really love hearing them. So thank you so much for sharing. And that gives sort of a flavor of what, oh, here's another one, Scotland. Uh, one side of the family came from Scotland and the other um, are a large part native. Uh, my dad arrived here when he was 10 months old. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And, um, and you know, as we share these, um, I, want, I want each of us to sort of think about uh, where we fit in when I start talking about the history. And because it's difficult to see from our individual perspectives, our stories are actually utterly shaped by policy and the law and how judges interpret those laws. So when all of our people um, migrated, that's not actually coincidental. You know, that was all, um, that's all part of, of what was allowed and what was, um, and what sort of the trends of migration were happening. So thank you for sharing that. Um, oh, there you go. And to give a little bit of background, in the US, the foreign born population is estimated to be 40 million people. And of that 40 million, 29 people, 29 million people are here um, as legal immigrants, so those are people who have green cards or who naturalized and became citizens or who are here on visas. And of that 40 million, there's an estimate 11 million who are here and who are considered undocumented. And um, for the most part, I think people think undocumented, they imagine people crossing the southern border without papers or something like that. But you can also be undocumented if you came to the U.S. legally with a visa, for example, a tourist visa or a work visa, but then you stayed longer than the visa allowed you to, a visa overstay. And, um, and in that case, you would also be undocumented. Can anyone guess what the largest source country for visa overstayers is? For people who are undocumented because they overstayed their visa? Any guesses? <laughs> um, it's China, that's a good guess. Mexico? Uh, those are good guesses. Canada. Yep, that's right. Uh, can Canadians are the largest uh, population of visa overstay people who are undocumented because they overstay their visa. 
But you don't hear um, the Trump administration targeting Canadians for being undocumented, right? Like that's not, and that's not an accident either. Um, I think that's intentional. Uh, but but there is a large, especially in northern state, northern border, northern border states like ours, there is a large population of undocumented Canadians. Mm -hmm. And just to give you a snapshot of Washington's immigrant populations, um, the majority of immigrants in Washington um, are, or the largest uh, group are from Asia, but actually the top three countries of birth are Mexico, the Philippines, and China. And maybe you see that reflected in some of your um, client populations. And so you might, ask or you might be asking you know why are there 11 million undocumented people um and you know we asked the question around migration we could have also asked the question of you know why do you why did your people come to the u.s or what do you know about why your people came and um the truth is there's so many different reasons why people migrate to the u.s um and it also and it's not all in the vacuum right the u.s foreign policy has made um has crippled the economy in different places and so um, people have been sort of pushed to migrate as well, and um, but now there are there is a large population of undocumented folks. And in 2013, there was immigration reform that was passed by the Senate that would have allowed for a huge uh, percentage of that population to be able to apply for lawful status and become citizens. But um, it wasn't passed by the House, and so it just stalled out. Also, there is sort of a myth about just, you know, people can just sign up or get in line, and that's not really true. There isn't, um, there's very few and far between ways of uh, proactively applying for lawful status. For example, DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, was one of those ways that if you sort of met the criteria, you could proactively apply, and we all know that that has since been rescinded. Um, moreover, there are ways that U.S. citizens can sponsor their families their siblings or parents um, or children, um, but those visas have very strict limitations. And from certain populations, like the Mexico and the Philippines in particular, the wait for those visas is actually 22 years. <laughs> you know, and so it's it's a pretty absurd um, uh, request to have someone stay in one country and apply and spend a lot of money, hundreds of dollars to apply with this hope that in 22 years they might actually be able to to um, immigrate here, and um, and immigration reform would have uh, would have shortened drastically shortened those lines, but it didn't pass. And so now we have um, an undocumented population where there are there's a huge part of that are children who came to the U.S. with their parents. Um, and they were undocumented, but they grew up here in the U.S. And those are often referred to as dreamers. And you might have heard that um, under the Obama administration, he created a an application that people could apply for DACA, and then um, for two years they they wouldn't be deported, and instead they could work. Um, President Trump rescinded that program um, about two months ago, and um, so we'll see over the next couple of years that people will begin losing their DACA status and and um, revert to being undocumented again um, and it was it was a really fantastic program that allowed so many people to come out of the shadows and it's it's a tragedy and i think it was really an act of cruelty really to to stop that program there's also a large population of mixed status families and those are people who um, the parents are undocumented but because of birthright citizenship which i'll discuss later um, they had their children in the u.s and Therefore, their children be, um, are U.S. citizens. And um, President Obama, uh, thanks to so much of um, the movement and protesting from Dreamers and um, the children of undocumented parents, um, he also created, along with DACA, a program called the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, DAPA. But um, before it could even go into effect, it was immediately stopped by the by the courts, by conservative courts, um, and by Republican uh, attorney generals. And so, unfortunately, that never um, saw the light of day. And so, we still have 11 million people who are undocumented. And so, now I'm going to go into some of the racial history of immigration law. 
And immigration law answers these three sort of broad questions. Who can come to our country? Who can stay? And who can become one of us? Who can become a citizen? And I really see that last question as a question of belonging. You know, there isn't, all that is really shaped by policy and who we think of as being American. And that has changed dramatically over the past, um, past couple centuries. So the very first law, um, the case that um, answered the question of who is a citizen is sort of the infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857. And this was, um, you know, on the eve of civil war, on the cusp of civil war, there was a man named Dred Scott who was a slave and his, uh, his owner was, was more liberal and um, took Dred Scott to a Northern free state and gave him a lot of independence. And, um, and Dred Scott married and had a child. And when his owner passed away, he became concerned that the owner's wife would sell his daughter into slavery. And so he sued for his freedom to say, um, to have sort of a um, proof that he was a free man and that he could be a US citizen. And there was this, this notion at the time that once free, always free. So once you sort of step into a free state that you would be free. Um, and so that was, it was this case um, really put that to the test. And the U US Supreme Court um, issued this infamous decision that denied um, Mr. Scott citizenship. And it has the quote in it that says, the black man has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. And that is our Supreme Court. That's the highest court in um, the country. And that was the statement it made. And so in other words, black people were not and could not ever be citizens of the United States. That's what that court case determined. And once that was determined, um, there was sort of no going back and our country um, sort of went to civil, got sort of engulfed in civil war to answer this question of whether um, black people could be free and be citizens and be one of us. And then after the Civil War, um, the 14th Amendment was added to our U.S. Constitution in 1868, and it created what's known as birthright citizenship, which says all persons born or naturalized in the United States can become citizens, are citizens. And so after that, um, if even if you were brought over because of um, and put into slavery, um, if your children, if anyone was born here, then they were citizens. And that, again, is called birthright citizenship. Now, the first law that that um, prohibited, so at that time in the US, in the, up until the 1880s, there was no law that prohibited people from coming into the US, from coming here. And the very first law on our books that did impact that and did prohibit groups from coming into the US was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And um, Washington State was one of the most vocal supporters of this Chinese Exclusion Act. And on the right hand side of your screen, there is a flyer um, from Mayor Weisbach of Tacoma, Washington. And um, it was a rally. And um, I actually, and I apologize for the offensive nature of this picture, and I hate it. So I'm going to um, move to a picture of my kids <laughs> just to give us uh, some relief from watching that, um, but I'll still talk a little bit about the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so this is the very first law that puts into place limitations on who can come to the US and it's entirely based on racism and um, classism. And it, um, and there was, in Washington State, there was something called the Tacoma Method where um, lawyers and law enforcement and even politicians would gather people from the Chinese community and um, and send them off on, on boats and trains and send them to California and away from Washington State and then they would burn down their houses. And this was happening in Tacoma and in Seattle and, um, and it's really uh, a stain, I think, on our history. And, um, but it was a way, and this, this Chinese Exclusion Act was a way to sort of pit white and um, Asian working class folks against each other is one of the sort of um, places where we could see that happening. Um, 
And the Chinese Exclusion Act was actually only repealed in 1943. And it was repealed by um, an act called the Magnuson Act, named after w Congressman Warren Magnuson of Washington State. And if you're in Seattle, you might have gone before to Magnuson Park, named after him. And um, it was really seen as a way for uh, Washington State to atone for its, um, its support of the Chinese Exclusion Act to begin with. But as you can see, it was on the books for all that time. <laughs> And so going back to the, 18, to the late 1800s, um, you know, another thing that the Chinese Exclusion Act did was it really set a tone in our country and it created um, a climate of anti-Chinese racism and probably racism against all, um, all Asians, but um, particularly against Chinese folks, um, people of Chinese heritage. And so there was a case, um, again, at the US Supreme Court called US v. Wong Kim Ark. And Wang Kim Ark was his, he was the child of Chinese immigrants. Um, his family owned a laundromat in San Francisco, and, but he was born in the US. And um, he went back to China to visit his family. And when he came back to the US, the border guard was sort of emboldened and said, no, there's a Chinese Exclusion Act. And, and because you're Chinese heritage, you can never be a US citizen. And so I'm gonna deny you entry. And so instead of being um, allowed to enter the US, he had to stay in Angel Island, which is um, sort of the West Coast equivalent of the Statue of Liberty, um, except it was a, a immigration detention center. Um, it included an immigration detention center. And he was detained there for months until his case went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually did the right thing in that instance and said, yes, anyone born in the US, even if you're Chinese heritage, you are a US citizen. Um, because of birthright citizenship. And so birthright citizenship was, again, affirmed by the US Supreme Court, and Wang Kim Ark was allowed to return to his family. But I wanted to point this out because um, I feel like something similar is happening here where in the US um, that we're seeing where because of the rhetoric, which is so, um, so which, which has demonized immigrants, particularly Mexican immigrants, um, you see that there are a lot of border patrol agents and ICE agents who are emboldened and are acting more aggressively than they had in the past because um, it's, it feels like, oh, well, anyone um, is subject to their authority. And so uh, we sort of see some of this activity now as well. So in 1906, there was the Naturalization Act, um, which, and that went to the question of who can become one of us, who can become a US citizen. And the determination it made was that only free white persons and aliens of African nativity and persons of African descent can become United citizens because of naturalization. And so even if your people came to the US, they could only become citizens if they were white. Um, and so this was this was the law in the books, right? That only white people could become citizens. And so one of the things um, sometimes I hear, particularly from people with uh, European heritage, is you know, oh, you know, why don't people just follow the laws? And why don't they just, um, you know, my people came here legally. Um, and you know, I really think about this history a lot in in that context because actually there hasn't been anything really up until today that has really limited. Uh, European migration or immigration, but throughout this history, there has been limits on um, on other groups, right? And then not only were there limits on who could come in, but once you could come in, you could only actually be a citizen and stay legally for you know for your whole life if you're white, right? And so um, so the laws were really just different depending um, on your race. And so this was the law that was passed by Congress. And then in the 1920s, um, that law was challenged. And it was challenged by Mr. Takao Ozawa, who was Japanese heritage and living, on, um, living in Hawaii. And Mr. Ozawa didn't challenge the constitutionality of those racial restrictions. You know, we have the, another part of the 14th Amendment is the Equal Protection Clause, which says that people have to be treated equally by our government. And so there could have been an argument, he could have made an argument to say, you know, that law um, violates equal protection, it favors white people over people of Japanese ancestry or Asian ancestry, 
or any other ancestry, and therefore it's unconstitutional. And we don't know how history would have um, how history would have responded to that. We don't know whether the U.S. Supreme Court at the time would have accepted that argument, and we'll never know. But um, instead, what Mr. Ozawa argued was that Japanese people are white, and his argument was that uh, Japanese people are white because their skin color is light skinned, um, like a white person's. Um, he had converted to Christianity. Um, so he said, you know, our religion is similar and he was fluent in English. And so basically the argument he was making was that he was fully assimilated into whiteness. And I just want to point out this dynamic because I feel like to this day, this is still a dynamic where we see that, um, that in order to sort of be, to assimilate into mainstream culture in America means to assimilate towards whiteness. And it's it's something that's pitted, um, particularly Asians, against um, white and black people um, and other pe groups of color. And um, you see Mr. Ozawa really actually making this as a formal claim that, that he was as assimilated as could be and therefore should be thought of as white. And the US Supreme Court was unanimous and they decided that no, um, Japanese people are not white, and to be white means to be Caucasian, as science at the time defined being Caucasian. And one of the arguments the court made, he, the court responded to all of Mr. Ozawa's arguments and said, you know, even though you're light skinned, we can't really just rely on skin color because even among white people, you know, you have the, and this is um, the judge, the justice's words, you have the swarthy, dark skinned Eastern and Southern Europeans and the fair blonde, um, Northern Europeans, but they're all white. And there's actually, there have been essays about sort of when the Irish became white and when the Jews became white, because at certain times in our history, there was, of course, uh, prejudices and um, discrimination against those groups as well. But at this point, um, the court decided that to be white meant to be Caucasian. Oh, someone asked a question, which is a great question. What does aliens of African nativity mean? Um, that means, so that is that distinguishes between people who were um, who are black but living in the Caribbean, for example. Um, and there was this fear at the time um, of members of Congress that there would be this influx of people from the Caribbean, um, which didn't materialize. Um, but and it was and that actually that phrase, aliens of African nativity and persons of African descent. Um, I think that was, again, like a tip towards the 14th Amendment and um, freeing the freeing of slaves. And I think it was that was actually largely symbolic because there wasn't actually that much uh, migration from the African continent at this point. But so another thing about the, what the court did really was they sort of made this determination that um, to be Japanese was to be perpetually and inherently foreign, no matter how much you assimilated, that you would always be seen as foreign and you could never be one of us. You could never be a citizen. Oh, gosh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and so the following year, um, my people in the pan South Asian way, um, they brought a case because, so Mr. Bhagat Singh Thind, who um, is from India and was living in Bellingham, Washington, um, he brought a case because Indians at the time were actually classified by science as Caucasian. <laughs> and, um, you know, we know that these groups, the categories were really broad. I, I believe they're Caucasian, Mongoloid, and African. And um, they're, you know, totally based in um, the, steeped in the racism of the time. And um, and they're inaccurate. But so, so, but Indians were actually classified as Caucasian. And um, so Mr. Thind um, applied for citizenship and citizenship was actually granted. And But almost immediately the government rescinded the citizenship and the government filed a case with the U.S. Supreme Court saying, you know, are, does Mr. Thind, who was born in India um, and is Hindu, they made sure to say, you know, is he white? And, um, and you know, Mr. Thind is a really interesting uh, person. He was actually the first person in the history of our country to serve in our U.S. military with a turban. 
and he fought for the U.S. in uh, World War One. And so I think that was another reason why he decided to apply because he he really saw himself as a patriot uh, of this country and was really proud to be a part of this country and fight for this country. Um, and because of, of course, the classification. But the same US Supreme Court who answered the question in the Ozawa case, again, unanimously said, well, you're not white. <laughs> and I know we said science, but we didn't mean just science. We meant science, pl uh, Caucasian plus the popular meaning of white person, which, which we all know means skin color. But um, they couldn't at this point say that it was Caucasian plus skin color because they had already made this whole argument about how <laughs> skin color isn't a good proxy because whiteness has so many shades. Um, and so uh, and so, what this is really is this is the test for whiteness. And the US Supreme Court, our highest court in the land, created this test for whiteness. And we know that, um, we know that race is a social construction and that the law plays a key role in that process. But I just feel like this these cases just show how much, um, you know, these things, what a huge impact these cases have made on to shape our country um, and the people who are in it. And it was made by these white male justices on the Supreme Court. And, um, and for me, it's always like a good reminder of how important it is to vote, especially in Washington State, since um, our judges are elected. Um, but how judges can make such a huge difference and how the law makes such a huge difference in our lives. And so after these cases, um, lower courts started answering the question of which different groups are white. So the Armenians came forward, the Persians came forward, and one by one, the different um, populations were deemed white or not white. White means you can become a citizen, not white means you can't. Um, and I think that shapes who we think of as white today. I mean, imagine if um, South Asians in 1923 were determined to be white, right? Or Japanese, um, you know, how different our country would look today. And, um, and actually um, in the 2020 census, so a lot of people from the Middle East were deemed white um, under these, these cases. And um, actually on the 2020 census, there is a movement to, to add different Middle Eastern countries so that they that Middle Eastern people could actually um, be distinguished from white people, um, and so oh yeah, and again, um, this court the the determination the bottom line is that Indians are perpetually and inherently foreign. So even if you've served in our military, even if you fought for our country, no matter what you can, there's nothing you can do because of the way you look, because of where you're from. You will always be foreign in our eyes. And so then after the 1920, uh, those 1923 cases, um, you see all sorts of changes in the law based on race. And so in 1924, there is a ban on all immigration from Asia. Um, and so if you think about that, you know, that's, that says that, so for all these years, no one from Asia could come to our country. It's not just becoming a citizen, but they couldn't even enter our country. Right, so what would our country look like if, if there had just been open immigration like there was for Western um, Europeans, for the whole world? You know, our country would look very different today. And there wasn't any parsing of words, there wasn't any sort of dog whistling at the time. It was very clear that the purpose of these laws um, were to preserve the racial composition and preserve the ideal of US homogeneity, um, which favored British and European immigrants. You know, as a white supremacist, all of these laws were um, were passed in order to maintain the white race and white um, power in our country. And then in the 1930s, uh, we saw programs that resulted in the deportation and repatriation um, targeting Mexicans. And that included one million Mexican-American children from the Southwest U.S. And so those are people who have become citizens, right? And still there's a sense of you are not one of us. You are, you are foreign, even if you're a citizen. That wasn't enough. And of course in 1942, Japanese internment, where 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry were interned and two thirds of those people were US citizens. So again, inherently foreign. And that Ozawa case at the beginning um, really sort of laid the groundwork for that.
like it was already determined that um, people of Japanese ancestry were less than or other. Mm -hmm. And then in 1946, we see a very slight loosening of these immigration um, laws. And there was a quota put into place where 100 Indians and 100 Filipinos were allowed to immigrate into the US. Um, and now, of course, they still couldn't become citizens because they weren't white. But if they had kids, then maybe their kids, because of birthright citizenship, could become citizens. But um, And this, I think, plays into another racial dynamic we still see today, which is the model minority uh, myth. Because of those 100 Indians or Filipinos, they were sort of the ones, the people who, in their own countries, had some of the most uh, amount of privilege, right? They were often the most educated, um, and they had a lot of resources and wealth in their own countries and were able to, to immigrate here. Um, and I want to make a note about the, Philip, uh, the 100 Filipinos. Before 1946, the Philippines was actually a colony of the US. And so um, the Fil people um, from the Philippines had were given US nationality. And so they were able to come and go. But after uh, the Philippines gained independence in 90, 1946, Congress sort of gave them this as a gesture said, okay, well, we can still allow 100 people a year from your country to, to enter ours. And then finally, it was the 1952 Immigration and Nationality Act, um, which is still actually the basis for our, our uh, country's immigration laws. Um, and that was the first time race is eliminated as the basis for citizenship. So that 1906 naturalization law, which said only white people and people of African descent um, could be citizens, that was finally eliminated in 1952, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, I mean, you know, we have the sense our, con our, our country is a country of immigrants, but really what that meant this whole time was that our country is a country of like European <laughs> immigrants, right? Because up until 1952, um, even if you got, you were sort of somehow able to get to this country, you could only become a citizen if you're white. And so the bar on Asian immigrants were lifted, but the 100 person quota system was put into place um, and it's still sort of based on race and not nationality. So for example, if you, um, if there, there was a 100 person quota from South Africa, which of course would have favored um, people with European heritage within that country versus um, anyone who is South African. Um, there's also a new thing put into place, which again, still exists now, and that was a system of skills and family unity-based immigration, um, where you could get visas based on family relationships and um, or also based on skills, so like uh, work skills, things like that. But still, 85% of visas at the time were allotted only to Northern and Western Europeans. And it wasn't until the 1965 Civil Rights Act, um, which also shaped the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act, where for the first time in our country's history, we have committed to accepting immigrants of all nationalities on a roughly equal basis. Um, and there was still, I, I guess something to note about this is that, um, you know, how important people's movements are and how they impact not just the group that's fighting, but all of our lives, you know, and so um, the civil rights movement was, um, you know, centered black liberation, but it impacted the lives of immigrants. And I see that happening today too with the Black Lives Matter movement, of course, and that how that is helping really all people of color um, and all people, not just people of color, actually all people in our country um, get the rights we deserve. And the 1965 Immigration Nationality Act had a focus on, um, Again, that skills-based and family-based unification. And so the uh, folks in Congress who are still pushing a white supremacist immigration agenda, what they um, what they they preferred was having uh, focusing on family unification over skills. And they thought that this would increase European immigration. So the thinking was, you know, since most of the people who immigrate here are from Europe, if we allow them to bring their families, then it would just sort of multiply the numbers of immigrant uh, of European immigration, and actually they were they were completely wrong. Um, and so in 1960, before this act was passed, 90 percent of immigrants to the U.S. were from Europe. By 2010, 50 years later, 90 percent were from non-European countries, <laughs> and so they were completely wrong. And um, actually, people from the rest of the world um, decided to bring over their families. Um, to the US and that has really made us a country of immigrants. And as I'll mention later, this is 
what's considered legal immigration. And this is a program that the Trump administration wants to cut in half. And I really see that as, again, this sort of white supremacist idea of um, now we're going to switch to wealth, to um, skills and wealth based immigration, hoping, again, to favor people from Western Europe, Western Northern Europe, Australia and um, other people over family immigration, which now favors um, people of the global south. All right. So that's, does anyone have a que any questions about um, sort of the history before I launch into immigration today? All right, well then moving, moving right along. <laughs> um, so, uh, so today what we see is um, the president, so in our country, uh, because immigration law is federal, um, the president has actually a huge uh, amount of power in determining our immigration laws, um, in determining who who can come into the country and who can become, um, yeah, who can who can sort of benefit from our immigration laws. Of course, certain things have to be passed by Congress, but the president certainly sets a tone. And so, um, Trump has has uh, determined that his immigration agenda, and I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this is first to deport 3 million of those undocumented people, to build a wall, to cut legal immigration in half, to switch, as I mentioned, from family-based immigration to wealth-based legal immigration. And there's actually this really, um, so there was um, a law that was introduced in Congress that the president supported a couple months ago about legal immigration. And um, and it was just unbelievable. I mean, it, it favored people who could invest huge amounts of money so even if you could if you could invest under 10 million like that wasn't enough you would get more points if you could invest over 10 million um dollars um toward towards you know those are sort of like different points you could get in order to get a green card um you know so favored the like hyper wealthy he's also um tried to make make efforts to halt our refugee program which was um which is one of the most which was one of the most robust in the world and of course, to ban immigration from Muslim countries. Um, those are some of the things he's talked about and he has pushed forward policies and executive orders around. And so I guess one of the questions um, I ask myself is, you know, what are his strategies in, in effectuating those policies that he um, has prioritized? And one thing I see is um, the demonizing of immigrants. And so we know that he started his very campaign on June 16th, 2015, by saying, you know, talking about Mexicans as um, being criminals, you know, and um, this demonizing and this, this criminalizing of immigrants is a tactic. And, um, and we see it, and we've seen it throughout history. And so that was also a tactic that was used in the Chinese um, Exclusion Act, you know, and to get that passed to show, you know, Chinese people are um, stealing our jobs and they're criminals and they're, um, harming often sort of uh, posed to harm white women is often like a tactic that's used. And we see um, Trump doing that with Mexicans today. He also called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the US, um, which we've heard. And of course, um, we've heard about the Muslim bans, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then also he, he made the speech where he talked about MS-13, the gang, um, as transforming peaceful parks and beautiful quiet neighborhoods into bloodstained killing fields. And it's like, really, he's just over the top, you know? And, and actually MS-13 is an American gang. It was founded in Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, he's trying to paint this picture where, um, where um, anyone with this heritage should be seen as inherently foreign, as other, as a threat and a danger. And there's actually, um, there's actually a background to this. And so, um, I heard uh, Tom Ikeda, the executive director of Densho, which collects stories of Japanese internment, explain why politicians try to demonize immigrants. And what he said was that um, by demonizing immigrants and making people afraid of immigrants, it primes the American public to oppress others and feel relieved when that group is is excluded. And so, so Mr. Ikeda said that you know during the Japanese internment, that's what was happening. People were um, were sort of 
primed to see the Japanese as being, um, you know, spies and and coming to our country to harm us and Americans and especially the white American population. And so when when they were interned, um, he said that you could just sense that Americans felt like a sigh of relief, like, oh, good, I'm glad that they're not going to harm us. And that's the same kind of rhetoric um, that we're seeing today. And also, the, it creates a fear in order to justify unprecedented investment in enforcement at a time when border crossing is actually has been in decline ever since the 2008 recession. So border crossing has actually been um, declining. And so, you know, there isn't actually a factual or rational need to build a wall, for example. But, um, you know, this fear sort of prompts people to um, to be able to justify that kind of investment. Another thing we're seeing is, um, I don't know if anyone on the call is from Burien, but um, Burien is about 10 miles south of, of Seattle in King County. And this past, uh, earlier this year, the Burien City Council passed by a vote of four to three, what's known as a sanctuary city uh, ordinance. And sanctuary city is a really broad term without a clear definition, but it's generally, um, uh, a city that that has decided not to cooperate with deportation, and of course, deportation is a federal um, enforcement program. And so, and in Washington State, law enforcement, local law enforcement, actually doesn't have any authority to enforce immigration laws. Those are um, those are powers vested in federal agents. Um, but so so often, sanctuary cities, sanctuary ordinances, just sort of um, clarify that policy. And so, the Burien City ordinance said that no police officer was allowed to ask someone their immigration status or their religion. And again, that isn't actually earth shattering or new. That was actually, that's always been the practice, um, or should be at least, <laughs> that's the practice that's actually in line with our Washington and US Constitution. But they just sort of put it in writing, I think in a way to sort of counteract the anti-immigrant narrative. Um, and so then a group called Respect Washington, which is mostly funded from money outside of Washington, um, uh, issued this ballot initiative to try to repeal that sanctuary city ordinance, and the and the language used just you know flows in line with all the sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric we have heard over the past you know 200 years. Threatens the safety of every Burian citizen, legal residents, by allowing criminal aliens like the one who shot Kate Steinle in San Francisco to prey upon people inside our peaceful town. And so a couple thoughts on this. Um, again, it's sort of pitting. Uh, um, illegals or you know people who are undocumented against the um, against a white woman, Kate Steinle, and actually the person who shot Kate Steinle was actually just acquitted. Um, the jury found that it was not an intentional um, killing that um, that he was carrying a gun, but it just went off, and sadly, very tragically, um, the bullet ricocheted off of something else and hit Kate Steinle. So it was an intentional murder of this woman. Um, but it still uses these ideas to try to to prey on people's fear of crime. And this was just this past summer. And actually, they did gather enough signatures to repeal the ordinance. But um, and there was something similar also in Spokane, also funded by the same group, Respect Washington. And um, but both were actually pulled off of the ballots because of legal action. They weren't um, they weren't legally sound uh, ballot initiatives. And I want to talk a little bit about the Muslim ban, which um, I'm sure you guys have been hearing about. So um, in January, kind of the, like the first week of that, um, mis that President Trump took office, he issued this, this um, executive order that banned any immigration from these different um, Muslim majority countries, Libya, Syria, Sudan, Iran, and at the time, Iraq. Yemen and Somalia. Um, and so this to me is an echo of the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? It's just saying, oh, we're just gonna ban, well, no one from these countries can come to the US, you know, for however wh however long. Um, and, it, and he said that it would go in effect immediately and this sent our nation's airports into chaos. And maybe some of you went and protested <laughs> at different airports. Um, but what ended up happening was people were on flights from those countries to the U.S. And when they got to the U.S., they were told, you know, no, you're 
we are banning people from your country from entering the US. And some of those people had green cards, you know, and some of those people had been granted visas already. And so, um, again, it was a sense of you're inherently foreign no matter what. Um, and you're inherently a threat no matter what. And so um, the courts actually stopped that. Since then, there's, so because they stopped that initial thing, the Trump administration issued a second, it's, well, Muslim ban 2.0 executive order. The courts halted that. So then the administration issued a third uh, Muslim ban um, that is that is that has continued to proceed through the courts. Mm -hmm. um, but just last week, the US Supreme Court said, while we determine whether um, the, the latest Muslim ban is actually constitutional, um, we're gonna allow the ban to go into effect. So as of today, if you are trying to enter the country from Syria for any reason, because you wanna visit family, because you wanna come here as a student or um, work here, you are not allowed, um, you're banned, uh, you're excluded from that. And so that's the, um, that's the current state of affairs, but as I mentioned, the ACLU and a number of other um, other groups like the Washington Washington State Attorney General are trying to fight this Muslim ban to say that it is unconstitutional. That's based that it violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. That's racist. That it um, harms one group over the other. And it's based not on a need to protect our country, not on actual national security threats, but rather just based on racism and xenophobia, which is not allowed under our Constitution. The other thing that the Muslim ban and um, the executive orders did was that it halted refugee admissions. Um, and so our country was one of the leading countries in the world that accepted refugees. And so refugees are, um, they, you know, under, under international law, they're people who are, have in their own countries been persecuted based on religion, um, race, ethnicity, um, belonging to a, a social a certain social group um you know things like gender so they have been um they're harmed by their own government and so countries around the world try to accept refugees to help protect them from being harmed in their own countries and the u.s was the leader was one of the leaders in accepting refugees and i just wanted to read this um this story um i don't know if any of you are familiar with this photo uh, blogger called Humans of New York. Um, it's this amazing blog that really captures people's stories and the photographer um, um, did a segment a, a couple of years ago in, uh, in Greece about Syrian refugees who had left there. And so this quote from this, um, this father says, you know, I wish I could have done more for her. Her life has been nothing but struggle. She hasn't known many happy moments. She never had a chance to taste childhood. When we were getting on the plastic boat, I heard her say something that broke my heart. She saw her mother being crushed by the crowd and she screamed, please don't kill my mother, kill me instead. You know, and so our, the stories of refugees are often tragic and, um, and they are often the most vulnerable in, our, in the world. And, um, and so to see them painted as being some sort of threat is really um, misinformation because often they are running from the same threats that we are <laughs> afraid of. And they are vetted. Um, I mean, the, the process to enter the US if you live in a refugee camp takes years because there's so much vetting. And, um, and so it's really such a shame. And, and it shows that we're really pulling away from so many of our international obligations and even our humanitarian obligations. And so these are these were places where we were really seen as as um, fighting for civil rights, fighting for human rights, and um, and acting in a compassionate humanitarian way, and we've stopped that, and we've um, and those were stopped for 120 days, and the numbers of refugees that we will um, bring in once the ban is lifted um, will be a fraction of what it was in the past, and so that's again really changing uh, um, who is in our country, what our country is going to look like, um, and. And yeah, and, and I think touches on our national identity. So I think another tactic that uh, the Trump administration is using is um, in order to, to deport so many people, um, you know, I think what he's doing and what we're seeing is that he's trying to coerce 
the police, like local law enforcement who work for the state or the county or different cities. Um, he's trying to use the resources of local police to enforce federal civil immigration laws. Um, and we at the ACLU think that this is this actually violates the Constitution, and we're trying to fight this. But um, you see it in a number of different ways. And so to give some background um, about federal agencies, the Department of Homeland Security is um, in charge of uh, immigration and um, and the two main immigration agencies um, in terms of enforcement are ICE, which is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And they enforce our nation's civil immigration laws and they identify and apprehend and detain and deport non-citizens. And so you, you may have heard of like things like ICE raids, you know, so they work in the interior of our country to come and find people um, who are undocumented um, or who are here lawfully, but then have um, maybe committed certain crimes or have violated some provision of their, um, their lawful status. Um, and then we also have the CBP, Customs and Border Protection, and they manage and control the border, and they have jurisdiction within 100 miles of the border. And so um, that provision, the 100-mile provision, was actually put into place in the 1950s under that 1952 immigration law. And um, there was no debate about it. It was just sort of written into the regulations. Um, but now, in 2017, 100 miles of the border, and it's not just the north and south southern border, it's also any sort of water border. So it encompasses two thirds of the US population. So like the whole entire state of Michigan, because of the Great Lakes, is considered within um, the border. Um, in Seattle, both Seattle and Spokane are 112 miles outside of the border. So we're sort of safe, although we still do see uh, CBP activity sometimes, especially in Spokane. But, um, but like Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, um, nine of the 10 biggest cities in our country fall within their jurisdiction and aren't at all what most of us would think of as being like border towns, right? Um, so they have a huge amount of power and authority. Um, and so these are the two main groups. And altogether, there are about 40,000, even with the increases, including the increases that Trump has argued for um, and who that's trying to, the, the administration uh, and, the, and the Republicans are trying to push, there's still only about um, 40,000 agents in like with both these groups um, in the whole country. And um, you need more of, more people on the ground to actually deport millions and millions of people, right? And so, um, so that's why they want to enlist the help of local law enforcement because there's over a million police officers. So their thinking is, well, if they can help us do some of the groundwork, it'll save the federal government resources and um, we'll be able to get more people. You know, but um, of course, one of the arguments we make is that, um, you know, the federal government has a lot of resources. Why should we be using our Washington state resources to further this um, really cruel immigration agenda? Um, and particularly because we think it's, it um, violates the Constitution to do so. So does anyone have any questions about the current um, uh, administration or any things that you guys have seen um, in terms of policy before I move on. All right, well then I will give you some information about what the ACLU of Washington is doing. Um, our work sort of falls into three different buckets and the first is to expand the rights of non-citizens. So we advocate for sanctuary cities um, and we try to fight discrimination cases whenever we hear of for example, um, a police officer calling ICE, you know, because the person they stopped was Latino. And we've seen that all over the state. Um, and we are trying to bring lawsuits against that, that practice because as I said, it's unconstitutional. Um, the police shouldn't be racially profiling and they shouldn't, of course, um, be enforcing civil immigration laws that's, that goes way beyond their, their local duties. Um, and so, for example, we had a case in Spokane where um, there was a man who was Latino and he was driving to church on a Sunday and he got rear-ended by a white driver. And so they pulled their cars off to the side of the road and a Spokane Police Department officer came 
took both their licenses and ran them as as is usual when an accident occurs. And then um, the officer gave the white person back their license and held the, the Latino driver's license and called ICE based on nothing more really than the person's name and appearance. And um, we filed a lawsuit saying that that was uh, discrimination and that violated um, the man's Fourth Amendment right because you're not allowed to just arrest somebody without um, you know, suspecting that they had committed a crime. And being undocumented isn't a crime, and it's certainly not a crime in Washington, um, where this uh, or Spokane, where um, this officer would have had jurisdiction. So we're looking for those kind of cases, and we're trying to fight that discrimination. And as I mentioned before, we're seeing that more um, federal agents, as well as local law enforcement, are getting confused and are getting more emboldened to act out sort of the discrimination um, that we're hearing so much of. Uh, we're also trying to fight the, those ballot initiatives, like the one we saw in Burien, and we're advocating for state and national legislation to be more pro-immigrant. Um, one other thing I'll mention is that um, most recently uh, we worked on a, an immigration ordinance in King County, where um, which would protect the rights of non-citizens and um, give and, and ensure that no King County time or money would be spent on on enforcing immigration law. And um, if you have a moment, I would love it if you emailed <laughs> and uh, called your King County uh, Council representative and, and help us fight for that. Um, and if you're interested, I could always send information to Ankita. Another thing we're doing is we're stopping Washington institutions from collaborating with immigration enforcement. So we're working with police departments and jails and the Department of Corrections and Department of Licensing to ensure that they do not um, collect first collect information about immigrants and then share that information with the federal authorities. Um, you know, we, as I've mentioned before, we believe that we should not be spending our limited resources on enforcing these, uh, these misguided laws. Also, there is so much misinformation and, and that criminalizing of immigrants, um, you know, is, is really based on um, false premises because study after study has shown, even conservative studies, have shown that immigrants actually commit crimes at lower rates than citizens. And so it's not in our public interest and our public safety interest to um, target um, or, or sort of exclude this population by local institutions. The next thing, we're, the last thing we're trying to do is to limit ISIS footprint in Washington. And so there is a um, the immigration detention center in Tacoma, the Northwest Detention Center. We're doing everything we can to shut that place down. You know, um, and this is a picture of uh, from inside one of the pods of the um, detention center. Um, you know, a lot of people are in there because simply because they can't afford to to pay a bond and get out, and um, it breaks families and it really destroys people's um, desire to want to fight for their right to remain here. Um, and it, and 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 again, these are people, immigration, uh, violating an immigration law isn't a criminal offense, it's a civil offense. And so in a sense, they haven't really, they haven't actually um, broken a law and so that uh, they, they haven't committed a crime just by being here. And so that's another reason why we wanna shut it down. There's a similar agreement between ICE and Yakima County Jail. And that's also something that we are trying to see if there's ways that we can advocate um, to get that, that agreement rescinded. And then finally, what you can do, and I'm going to pass it over to Ankita for this. Uh, thanks, Anoka. Um, you know, one of the things um, that I was just thinking about in listening to just the historical perspective is how much of it is familiar. You know, like how much of it is, um, it's not new tactics, right? And so I really appreciate, I mean, so, and to be quite honest, like there are some of these laws that, and, um, things that I'm hearing for the first time, even though I had a class in law school on race and the law, right? So it's um, interesting to hear about the history and also realize that this is not new and that there have been uh, strategies in the past that have been, you know, that have allowed people to stop uh, harmful practices and that we can do that again, you know? So it's not about reinventing the wheel, but how can we work together together 
um, ongoingly together uh, to, uh, you know, to like really advocate for immigrants um, in this country. Um, I just want to like go through, um, you know, a few bullet points, you know, based on what you, you as an advocate in your programs can do uh, with this information. Uh, so one of the like one of the main things that I can think about and, you know, can please like chime in. Uh, but one of the main things that I can think about is, you know, how can we reframe the narrative within the system? You know, a lot of a lot of uh, practices are built upon, um, you know, like old systems and people don't really understand or question why things are in place or why things are being done a certain way. And so one of the major things that we can do is, you know, how can we uh, really question, you know, uh, practices and procedures within our agencies and within the system um, to make sure that uh, there is meaningful access uh, to services for immigrants. And I can think about a couple of like major themes here, like um, access, um, language access, and then also having culturally centered advocacy practices within your programs and making sure that other entities are functioning the same way, whether you're working with housing authorities or you're working with employers or small businesses, like how can they have uh, practices that um, really allow for immigrants to participate in a really full way. So that's one big thing that I see advocates can do um, in their work is to just, uh, not just for survivors, but just for immigrants in general, like how can you ensure meaningful access the second thing um, that I was thinking about, and you know, again, I just want to call out the way you framed it, is that how uh, President Trump is coercing local authorities to cooperate with ICE. And so, as advocates, you know, it's really important for us to understand, you know, that there is that element of um, where that element of like law enforcement feeling confused or, you know, really feeling like they have to, and so. You know, and in some cases, they outright just don't want to, right? So I, I, it, it's like a whole spectrum. And so how can we work with law enforcement to really make sure that uh, their practices, again, um, is setting immigrant uh, people from immigrant communities to come forward and report uh, crime uh, because it's really a question of public safety. And if immigrant communities are not feeling safe to come forward, then it makes them a lot more vulnerable to crime in general. And um, on the same token, also educating the public um, ar around why limiting victim and witness trust in law enforcement undermines everyone's public safety. So it's not just educating survivors or immigrant communities, but everyone in general. And then um, the other thing, the other two points um, that I always talk uh, to advocates about is really understanding immigration options. Um, here at Wiskadev, we've uh, provided several immigration options training. Usually we do it um, in conjunction with uh, legal aid attorneys uh, from the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, from Northwest Justice Project, and that's um, our effort to really get advocates connected to uh, those organizations so that they can co-advocate uh, within the legal system for survivors to really fully utilize their immigration options. So as advocates, it's important to understand immigration laws, but also, you know, immigration attorneys are best uh, positioned to really know how, what, what the laws are and how to use them um, in the best way possible for survivors. And uh, we will, we have um, these immigration option trainings regularly. So just be on the lookout on our website or through our publicity when the next one is coming up. I haven't yet uh, decided when I would have one, but um, I do try to have at least one immigration options training for advocates just so that people are staying um, in the know of uh, what the current options are for immigrants and for survivors. And then finally, collaborate with immigrant advocacy organizations such as the ACLU, the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, One America on advocacy, on understanding policy, on, uh, you know, going to lobby day or advocacy day, as we would like to call it, and um, all, leveraging those relationships to look at, you know, where are there uh, discriminatory practices that you can you know, uh, bring forward. Where are there? Where are 
their unjust policies and practices that need to be changed. Um, is advocacy the right method? Is changing the law the right method? Like there can be multiple strategies on how to uh, effect change in local communities. And the way to do that is really to work hand in hand with us here at the coalition, with the ACLU, with NERP, One America. Uh, these are all great entities that are trying to really figure out like, you know, what is the big picture that needs to change, but they're also willing to hear uh, the individual cases in terms of um, what has to be different uh, so that immigrants are not just threatened by uh, abusers, but they, like we want to prevent them uh, to feel threatened by the system itself. And so we're trying to not just mitigate abuser generated threats, but what are the system generated threats that uh, keep people in abusive relationships. So um, I just wanted to like take that opportunity to uh, really distill all the fantastic things that you have said into like, what can you do with it? What can you do with that? With a much more firmer understanding of um, our, like how immigration laws have been shaped in this country and what the way forward is, you know, which is to really look at how can we reframe the narrative? Thank you. Did you want to add anything else around systems advocacy? I know that you have a couple more slides. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. I think actually um, it's been interesting to partner with police officers and police chiefs because I think they really get it, that they don't want, mm -hmm. they really want to send a message to the um, non-citizens in their communities that, you know, we're here to fight crime. We don't mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and crime comes in all different races and nationalities, and we don't care, you know, about enforcing immigration law. We want um, to enforce our Washington state laws and make sure that our whole community is safe. And so, um, so, so yeah, that's definitely something that we've been able to partner with police chiefs about. But yeah, and, and so I would love it if, um, if you would, all of you would keep in touch. And um, my contact information is in the upper right hand corner. And especially, and these are sort of the three areas that, that I, I was thinking might impact your work the most. But if you see police officers in your community calling ICE um, and reporting people or um, you know helping ICE to pick people up um, and arrest them in their neighborhoods, you know, let us know because we really they should not be doing that. Um, and so and there might be something we can do in terms of advocacy or litigation to fight that practice. Another thing is that um, under this administration, ICE agents have been going um, in and around courthouses. Um, and in Washington State, what we're seeing is that um, in a number of different counties, the ICE has been waiting in the parking lots or on the sidewalks of a courthouse so that when someone who's a non-citizen uh, leaves, um, they arrest them. And that undermines um, the protections we have at courthouses. And it, um, and you know, I'm sure you guys are seeing that, that, that it might um, hinder your clients from seeking orders of protection at the courthouse and things like that. So if you're seeing that in your neighborhood um, or you're in community, please let us know. We, we're trying to track where in the state this is happening. Uh, and and um, the other thing that we're seeing is that ICE and um, Customs and Border Protection are racially profiling. And so they are um, particularly, um, We've heard reports, especially in Spokane, of CBP agents uh, following people who look Latino and asking them, um, and but not asking white um, people for their papers and where they're from and things like that. And um, and so if you're seeing that in your communities, um, please let us know. Uh, those are those are sort of three areas I thought maybe. Um, uh, yeah, if you guys are seeing that, we would love to to hear about it. And so if ICE and CBP is active in your area, um, you should know that there is this sort of statewide hotline to report ICE activity. Um, and you'll, ha you ha you'll have it in your slides, but it's 1-844-RAID-REP, 724-3737. And um, that's a way to uh, report ICE activity and there are um, sort of immigration attorneys on hand to respond. And if you want to be notified that ICE is active in your area, um, there's also a text alert system. 
And the number there to sign up for that text alert system is 253-201-2833. So if you text that number, you'll get signed up. And um, just actually, this happened just earlier, or maybe it was at the end of November. Um, ICE, there was a text that went out that said ICE was active in this neighborhood in King County and people mobilized immediately. And actually ICE was asked to leave and um, wasn't able to arrest someone that day. And so um, it's a really powerful system sort of using um, advocates and, and just people all around the state. And, um, you know, something to, if, if ICE, if an ICE agent um, is trying to get into your center or your place of work, um, something to remember, and, and actually NERP has great resources about this, is that you can always demand that an ICE agent show you a judicial warrant before they enter the private areas of your office. So if your office has a locked door to the front, like no one can even enter, then um, ICE would need a warrant to even get in. Um, of course, if you just let them in, <laughs> then they don't need a warrant, but um, but that's something that we um, are, are uh, trying to encourage people to sort of assert that right, that you have a right to ask to see a judicial warrant. Um, and NERP has a uh, an advisory about that if you want more information. And, yeah. then, and uh, also NERP uh, helped us distinguish in a, like, a previous webinar that there's a difference between a judicial warrant right. versus, um, you ICE. know, an ICE, uh, <laughs> what do they call it? Well, ICE they call warrant. it a warrant also. <laughs> I mean, that's it's like really unfair, but it's like double speak. You know, uh -huh. they, they call they use some of the terms in criminal justice to give them because those terms have a lot of power. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, they, they call them ICE warrants, but actually they're just pieces of paper where they themselves sign it. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, they're just calling it um, a warrant. It's not... Uh, it's not reviewed by a judge at all. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, advocates can easily distinguish that by looking at the warrant to see if it's um, a judicial warrant. Right, right, right. yeah. If it says it was issued by a court. Um, another thing you can do is to take pictures, like, from inside your offices. You can take pictures of their vehicles um, and send them when, when you report the ICE activity to the hotline. Um, and I should have mentioned this, um, but in terms of your clients, Everyone in the U.S. has a right to remain silent. Nobody has to ask questions. But the thing that's so difficult about ICE is that, first of all, they don't have to tell you you have the right to remain silent because unlike um, law enforcement who have to tell you when they're arresting you, you know, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say will be used against you. Because ICE and immigration law is civil and not criminal, they don't have to give you that warning. And so um, something you can remind your non-citizen clients about is that they always have the right to remain silent, but they never have to answer any questions at all. Um, especially, and the question they don't want to answer is, where were you born? Because the minute they say somewhere other than the US, then ICE has the authority to arrest them right there. Mm -hmm. So um, they don't have to answer any questions at all. And there, So there's a oh. question in the text box. Do you want me to? Yeah. Here, I'll go ahead and read it, and Inoka, maybe you can share your thoughts about this. So, um, um, in the chat box, the question is, what advice should I give a client whose abuser is an undocumented immigrant? I have had some, some uh, survivors that want to notify ICE on their abuser just to get away from them. Oh, that's really... <laughs> that's a hard one. Yeah, I mean... Um, okay, it, that is a very hard question, but um, the way I tend to think about it is that, uh, you know, do the best, you know, we believe in survivor-centered advocacy and that, you know, like, let's advocate for on behalf of the survivor in the best way possible, but, um, you know, there are ways for uh, survivors to you know, be safe from the abu the abusive partner, and it could involve like a million things. I frankly would not want to get the survivor entangled with um, um, ICE agents on their case. Um, it, it's just something that I wouldn't do as an advocate, but um, it, it is a hard one. You know, I just feel like you know, you can call law enforcement, you can call, I mean, you know, because ICE is, like you're saying, ICE is not in a position to, 
enforce uh, criminal laws. <laughs> They're just there to enforce civil laws, and we want to hold them accountable to that standard. And so calling ICE um, on a, cr a local crime just is, it's like reaffirming that narrative that we're trying to get away from, mm -hmm. frankly. So I don't know, that's how I would sort mm -hmm. of rationalize that, but uh, what would you say? Yeah, also just, um, be, I, I mean, I agree, because local law enforcement is more in, more slightly more, it depends on, on it, but, um, you know, that because it's within their job to protect mm -hmm. people or to enforce these laws um, around domestic violence, it seems like they would be the first step, you know, and, and immigration agents, um, they are only focused on immigration. And if they're called, they will arrest anyone in their sight, not just um, the abuser. And so sometimes that can impact, have a much greater impact than um, is originally intended. Um, and so I mean, there's no good answer yeah. <laughs> to it, but it, um, I feel like when you do involve immigration, it could have a much larger unintended consequence mm -hmm. of harming like an entire community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, and then um, do you have, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, they're just, um, okay, okay, thank you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, just to like, uh, again, underscore the, the point that we're making over here, which is, you know, all of this is about, you know, one, reframing the narrative within the system and then also holding the system accountable. There's so many advocates in the country right now that are, you know, um, holding, you know, um, like holding the system accountable, like starting from the Trump administration all the way down to local uh, law enforcement and so I don't know I would just like go through this analysis of like you know we are trying to hold the system accountable and you know where do we actually go you know to make sure that the survivor gets um, her needs met and that she's feeling safe versus you know the survivor thinks that this option like the option of calling ICE is the best option for her but until you've explored all the options, you don't really know. So mm -hmm. that is uh, like, you know, again, like we're trying to keep the system accountable. We want to stay uh, on track and focused on how can we increase meaningful access, you know, to the system for um, immigrant communities in general. Mm -hmm. And so what day-to-day uh, -day practices do, can ad like our advocates really taking to make sure that that's happening without contradicting themselves, you know? So, it, it's it's a really hard time, you know. I feel like um, in the past year, some of the things that advocates have uh, brought forward, it, it's just like a lot of confusion. There's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of like we don't know what to tell survivors. And I think it's really about taking it one step at a time and making sure that you're affirming the relationships in your community with local law enforcement, with a legal aid organization such as NERF and Northwest Justice Project and to really call on fellow advocates to problem solve really tricky questions like the one that we were asked. Mm -hmm. And I guess the last thing I would say is um, if you want to help change the system and want to do um, uh, to take action, we do have the ACLU of Washington does have an email activist network. Uh, where you'll get sort of action alerts. And so we recently did one about the King County immigration ordinance to, to local King County folks. Um, but we have action alerts all over the state um, about things that are going on um, where you can take a role in, um, you know, calling your representative or um, or supporting one policy or, um, or um, all sorts of different things. And so you can sign up at aclu-wa.org slash get involved. But thank you so much. Uh, for having me and um, and 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 Kita has and you guys all have my email uh, address. So if you ever want to get in touch, um, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Inoka. Uh, we really loved having you here, and hopefully we can work on something yeah. together in the spring, uh, more on immigrant rights and justice. Um, um, I just want to say if. Uh, you have any additional questions, please feel free to call me or email me. Uh, the PowerPoint has been uploaded under the handout section that you can download.
It's both in uh, PDF format and PowerPoint format. So feel free to download those handouts. Um, and then at the um, end of this webinar, when you um, when we end it, uh, you'll see an evaluation form that will pop up. Make sure that you let us know who from your program attended. I know uh, folks tend to crowd around a computer sometimes, and you know we want to make sure that uh, we are accounting for everyone. So make sure that you you let us know who has attended. And on that note, uh, thank you everyone for attending this webinar, and we will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.